done to bring me happy To a captain's log. This is Lily. And this is Brian. Wait. <laughs> That's not right. This isn't a mere universe. What happened? There's no opposites. But Trekkies, we have a true treat for you to treasure with us as Lily and I are set to interview a very familiar Federation foe. Ooh, yes, a favorite foe and new friends to our show. We have Mary Chifo from Star Trek Discovery here on a captain's log in a two-part interview starting in a matter of moments. BK or Trekkies. No Mary Chifo as Chancellor Laurel from Discovery in seasons one and two. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I'm sure when Mary was quickly discovered as being the right fit during the final casting, knowing the role was now in her reach. She watched and researched, as awesome performers do, of course, as many Klingon character-driven episodes and film of Trek as yes, she possibly could. Absolutely. And stepping into any role, but in particular, a makeup-heavy role like a Klingon is at the forefront of Star Trek fans' minds at all times. And I'm sure it was with Mary playing Laurel Yes, as Laurel. Well. Uh, of course. Laurel is a heavy-hitting Klingon commander appearing in 10 of Discovery's 15 first-season episodes. Okay, three of second season's Star Trek Discovery episodes as well. So there's a lot of Laurel. My two favorite episodes, by the way, Lily, mm -hmm. are Laurel-centric episodes titled Battle of the Binary Stars, one of the earlier ones, and Point of Light from season two. Ooh, I love Point of Light. Mm -hmm. Yes, be sure to rewatch those powerful Klingon episodes with Laurel, showing her strong female leadership legacy, eventually becoming the leader as Chancellor of the Klingon Empire on Paramount+. Plus. And BK, Mary also reprised the role of Laurel in Star Trek Online. Oh, yes. Did you know? I, that's right. I forgot about that. That is one of the most successful and longest running video games out there. Star Trek Online, and it has the name of Star Trek associated with it for video games. And with Mary Chifo being a part of the already long running legacy of Star <laughs> Trek, you know, Lily, going back to my favorite Discovery episodes with Mary Chifo's Laurel, after Takumva was killed shortly thereafter at the Battle of the Binary Stars, Laurel faithfully followed Vok as the new leader of the House of Takumva in season, uh, in season number one. Yes, one of my favorite profound lines of leadership from Laurel is this. Takuva believed the quickest way to bring us together was war with the Federation. But in this fight, we have lost our way. A new leader is needed to fulfill my Lord's vision. I am that leader. <laughs> it sounds like a true leader. Laurel, House of Tacumba. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> also, Brian, Laurel's mother was born to the House of Mokai. Oh. And Laurel considers herself to be a part of both Klingon houses. That's right. They do. They, they have two different houses. That's correct. That makes sense. Now, Lily, let's get to our single item of Star Trek news before before we move on to one of our most exclusive interviews with Mary Chifo. Ooh, indeed. Last season, we interviewed the one and only Julianne Grossman, who voices the ship's computer from Star Trek Discovery, and who is one of Southern California's smoothest and most eclectic voices. We showed a nice clip of the new video game Star Trek Resurgence from Dramatic Labs, and Julianne was kind enough to reveal she lent her voice to this brand new video game and that Jonathan Frakes was involved. That's right. favorite. <laughs> yes, I love Frakes. I forgot about that. That's right. She did share that inside information way before it was released. Freaking awesome. <laughs> Jonathan freaking awesome, yes. <laughs> a nice news edge Julianne was kind enough to share with us in season one. Rewatch that episode, fans, if you'd like. Now, there's further information. This is the news part about it. About Jonathan Frake's involvement, it was revealed that Star Trek Resurgence gains a major Star Trek The Next Generation icon as Captain Will Riker is a part of this new video game. And it's developed by Dramatic Labs, as you indicated, Lily. Mm -hmm. Also released by Epic Games, Star Trek Resurgence is a single-player narrative adventure game that lets players play as Starfleet Troopers. Now, this was recently released on May 23rd. Star Trek Resurgence is playable on Xbox, PlayStation, and an Epic Games Store exclusive on PC. Oh, I need to get a PC so I can check out that game. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do too. And I can use some fast thumb motions, you know, action, pushing those buttons and firing the phasers. And Absolutely. Brian and I will interview Mary Chifo in just a moment. A captain's log returns in a moment. 
Welcome back to A Captain's Log. Brian and I are thrilled to be talking for the next 20 plus minutes with Mary Chifo, Star Trek's first female Klingon leader and so much more. Mary, welcome aboard. Katlo, as we would say in Klingon, thank you for having me. I'm also here with Jeff <gasps> Lorel. We like to hang out sometimes. I mean, now the, I guess the fabric of magic has been broken or whatever, but we're both very happy to be here. Mary, as you know, you played Laurel in the first and second seasons of Star Trek Discovery, and we love Laurel. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we're mind blown right now. <laughs> there's, there's a whole lot of significance that you bring to this role. You're the High Chancellor and the leader of the Klingon Empire, and you show great love while transforming Ash Tyler to Volk. Plus, you're a mother. I mean, what did you like the most about playing Laurel, and what are some of your deep insights about the character? I definitely do. I'm so uh, grateful always to get such a... Um, you know, uh, in-depth question about Laurel. And, and I can tell, you know, from both of you that you really appreciate um, the layers that Laurel was allowed to have. Um, and I definitely feel that as an actor, that's always my goal. I love playing great characters like Laurel who kind of straddle multiple binaries, whether it be gender or morality. And as a Klingon, you really do have access to those things so beautifully in your storytelling. And uh, in thinking about this question, one of my favorite lines I said, actually, in the fourth episode of the first season that was cut within the scene, but to me as like the tenet of Laurel, it was definitely the essence of the scene, which is <laughs> which is to conquer compromise. And it's when Laurel's convincing Vogue to go over to the Shenzhou to get the dilithium processor. Um, even though he feels that that would be, you know, disrespectful. And she's like, hey, man, we've been <laughs> we've been starving for six months. We got to make some compromises here. Um, and I love that that's an aspect of Laurel that we see very early on as we get to know her as a commander. Um, and then I think her arc for the first season that then, of course, bleeds into the second season is learning how to compromise and you know she sees that within her klingon realm with Vogue, but um it isn't until you know she has these interactions with admiral cornwell and um and burnham L a little less with Giorgio, but it's <laughs> they have a special relationship and they do find their way to each other in the second season um but after having more uh, closer to positive um interactions with humans uh, and of course, you know, with with Vogue slash Tyler, it's it's you know she sees Tyler as um, as Klingon and not human, but then has to respect who Tyler is as a human, and so she does have to compromise. So I think that that line is you know the essence of Laurel and kind of every episode that she's in, every um, moment that she's in throughout the two seasons. Uh, she's faced with that in one way or another. But even before that, her arc, I, I referenced uh, throughout our various panels in the first um, uh, season, promoting the first season, how Grilka from Deep Space Nine was one of my favorite female Klingons because the episode with Quark is, it really illuminates how the Klingon society still upholds the male of the household and that Grilka can't succeed her house and has to marry Quark in order to like maintain, you know, obviously they, end up resolving it in an even better and more humorous way. But that really struck me as I was watching that episode outside of the awesome performance um, of um, that actor playing Groka. Um, so to me, Laurel, you know, the beauty of these characters in this new era, era of Trek, which I'm sure we'll touch on more with further questions, is that I got to have that over two seasons. So it is a really beautiful, you know, female empowerment story, which is, you know, pretty much everything I want to put in the world. So <laughs> yeah, and I, obviously I could go on and on, but I know further questions will just, I'll keep answering this question as we keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I have so many more <laughs> questions about Laurel. Oh my gosh. But BK, you also had a question about Laurel. Yes, I did. Absolutely. Now, Mary, based upon your response and all those layers within the Klingon society, I'm sure Lily and I could do more. So we can ask so many more questions. <laughs> so many more questions. Yes. Now, one of my favorite episodes from Discovery is the season two episode, Point of Light. Klingon Empire is at risk of fracturing just minutes after unifying. And your character, Laurel, who is pregnant with Volk's child, this is revealed in the episode. Now, Laurel is also Chancellor. Some houses are unhappy about Laurel's ascension. 
But I love all that Klingon drama that you're at the heart yeah. of. So, Mary, what are some of your favorite memories from filming on the set of Star Trek Discovery when you were there in Toronto? And can you specifically touch on the episode Point of Light? Yes, Point of Light is definitely one of my most treasured episodes because um, both in, to your question, both uh, the memories of filming it, uh, which I called Klingon Summer Camp, which I'll get into more details, and then also the fact that Laurel got so much space uh, to tell her story in that episode. It was such an honor um, to get to have such a Klingon episodes. Because in my uh, research, when I was casting the role, I watched all the Klingon-centric episodes um, throughout all the different shows. And you see these like iconic Klingon moments. Um, and so to know, I would had, you know, plenty, plenty in the first season, but it felt like one of those that was like point of light is a Klingon episode. Oh. Um, and uh, that just felt so, and it was my first episode back for the second season and Laurel had a new look and like, it, it was just so thrilling. And to the Klingon summer camp of it all, um, the, this is, there's, a, there's multiple kind of like prequels to getting to the episode, but funnily enough, this was right at the moment. So it's second season of the first season has aired and uh, we're all feeling the love and the hype and the sense of community with our cast and obviously are getting amped up to not only start the second filming the second season, but starting to do conventions and getting to meet fans who have now seen the show. And so my first big convention that I did a star, you know, star Trek centric one uh, was in Dortmund, Germany. And uh, Shazad, Mary Wiseman, and Ken Mitchell and I were all, the, we were the four Discovery actors that went. And so it was such a thrill. We got to travel to Germany and uh, be at this convention. And, and Germany is also like, no surprise, very Klingon happy. <laughs> <laughs> the Germans, they're very robust like the Klingons. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're like, we get it. Uh, <laughs> Um, and uh, so we had such a lovely reception there. And the final night, we were all hanging out at the hotel bar and uh, started talking about how there should be a Klingon musical episode. <laughs> Your own Klingon musical. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Shazad and Ken and I and uh, John Van Sitters, who's VP of licensing and many awesome person. And uh, we were all just sitting around chatting about it. And then we just started like improvising a musical. <laughs> and we, we knew at that point, we were back for the second season. We had heard rumors of this baby. We had, we knew Ken was back. You know, we knew that there was some way they were bringing him back and that he would be playing the father of his character. And we were so thrilled that that was the case. And obviously they had left it that Tyler had, you know, gone off to Kronosh with Laurel uh, and that I was chancellor. Yes, it, it sounds like a Shakespeare episode. Uh, tell us a little bit more about this. And so we just kind of improvised a musical around that. And, you know, Tyler's really brooding and doesn't know who he is. And I'm like up against the patriarchy and Ken's being mean. And um, it was a delight. And we really, there's like a three and a half minute like section. We, we, there's about 30 minutes of footage that no one ever needs to see, but there's a three and a half minute one that kind of really, this is the weird part, crystallized what we then, like we flew the next day got back to LA and I feel like we got an outline of the of the episode that day. And it was like almost exactly what we had like <laughs> come up with in our silliness um, <laughs> with the baby. And the, I mean, it, you know, yeah. it kind of, you know, wrote itself in, in all that way. But anyway, so that's like a fun prequel, but Shazad and Ken and I, you know, were, are, you know, buddies and, you know, they're like my big brothers and, um, you know, had been in the trenches together in the first season. So getting to come back and play with them uh, for this episode, we also, because it was such a tremendous amount of, you know, scenes and, and all that sort of stuff in that episode, I was up in Toronto for, about a month um, from, and because we had to do makeup tests and like do, because it was all these new looks. Okay. Um, so we were up there all in the same hotel. And so we would just like meet up and run lines and like play some ping pong and like <laughs> order out. And um, it, it was such a beautiful creative time and everything was spaced out a bit more. They had really like, you know, we had all learned in the first season you know, okay, if you have this many days, let's try and make it so you're not in makeup every single day. And uh, 
So that was just really, really fun. It was a, you know, a pivotal episode for Laurel. And so that was really wonderful. And especially for the speech, we really talked about how Laurel kind of has this journey from, um, you know, she does have the lower cut kind of copper dress uh, that is more, you know, in line with what we've seen in the past with female Klingons. Um, and in this arc of losing this child uh, and, and Tyler, you know, <laughs> we think literally, right. but... Uh, but actually, <laughs> uh, but in this loss, and I've spoken to in the past of the metaphor of what unfortunately a lot of women feel that they need to or are forced to uh, do to have a career, which is cut off those that they love and cl cut off family and not allow themselves to um, do anything but their job, um, which, you know, I believe is is counterintuitive and not true. I think we all need to dedicate ourselves to our, our work and our craft and be passionate, but we can surround ourselves with those that we love. And Sonequa Martin-Green is a shining example of that with her now two children and amazing husband, Kenrick. Um, so I love that I got to embody all of that. And <laughs> the fun thing of doing a prequel is that we don't know why no one talks about Laurel in the future. You know, I think that always intrigued me to play any character in Discovery in the first two seasons was very intriguing because you go, why, why is my character not known in the future? Unless you're playing, obviously, a canon character that we do, <laughs> do know. But I thought that that was such a fun aspect of playing a, a totally new character. Um, that hadn't been alluded to before in, in any other show, because you go, we don't know. We don't know why they aren't as prominent in the history books. <laughs> for sure, you keep opening up more possibilities for us to ask even more Laurel questions. We are loving it. <laughs> Absolutely. Those are a few different thoughts and anecdotes. Again, it's uh, such a delight to talk about those episodes and those moments because uh, they are so precious to me. And again, just what an amazing opportunity to get to do so many things. And also just how it's like, like you said, it's very, it's a lot of story. It is like a Greek Shakespeare. And I know we'll talk more about Shakespeare. Like it is so epic. Yeah, I think it's because you're creating the character Laurel as your own, almost like a blank slate for you because it's so early on in Klingon society as a prequel too. Yeah, so it's so fun uh, to be able to, to just lean into that and, and just have fun with it. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. Thank you for tuning in. We're all grins here on a captain's log this week. And as always, <laughs> yes. Lily and I are in the middle of an enthralling conversation with Mary Chifo discussing her role as Chancellor Laurel from Star Trek Discovery. Mary, while I was researching Laurel and comparing what people had commented about her online, there was a villain's wiki where Laurel came up. So I was wondering how you think of Laurel. I mean, obviously, as Laurel, you probably don't think of her as a villain. But <laughs> story wise, what do you think of that? As someone who loves villains and to me, like the word villain is is very open. Like, I, I, yeah. I think, you know, again, like I said, the, being a gray character to me, like any character that is not overtly good can be seen as a villain. And the Klingons specifically, like, came out of the Cold War and yes. um, the way we were viewing the other. Mm -hmm. And that was certainly, I think, you know, the huge um, uh, premise and impetus for Brian Fuller when he initially created the concept for Discovery in homage to Undiscovered Country um, and obviously the relationship with the Klingons there. Um, so, <laughs> but tying into your question, oh, about villain. Yes. So I think <laughs> that was always a huge aspect of the Klingons within Discovery was, yes, we are technically the villains, especially in the first season, but what is the nuance of that? And obviously Tyler as a character is a huge way that Burnham has to come face to face with um, how she's vilified an entire culture and now is in love with someone from that culture. Um, and, you know, uh, Laurel gets to parallel that you know, that that I loved Vogue, uh, who was a Klingon and refused to see Tyler as anything but Vogue uh, and then have to come to, to terms with the fact that because of me, <laughs> 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 to be clear, Laurel definitely can live in a lot of regret of her own actions, but did have to come to terms with the fact that he was his own human and that he was not, um, he, he, he was not Vogue, he was his own entity. Um, and that humanity is far more powerful, like the literal humanity, humanness um, is just more powerful than she was led to believe by her um, 
Klingon upbringing um, and all of what Takuvma said. And what's interesting too within the Klingon culture is that, yeah, Takuvma, House Takuvma, we're the misfits. You know, we're the ones that have not been respected by the other Klingons. So Cole's the, you know, the kind of typical robust Klingon uh, kind of paving his way. And then we obviously see the houses all start really fighting near the end of the first season. And I, uh, I got to whip them into shape. Um, <laughs> but I think the the nuance of then too is Cole a villain, you know, like I come up against him with, um, you know, when I'm on the ship with Admiral Cornwell and it, there's, that's what I think these stories can really examine is who is the bad guy? Um, everyone and no one. Um, and I, but uh, all that being said, I think those are kind of the larger themes. I do think specifically with the rel, when it came to how her plot was portrayed in the first season, excuse me, <laughs> chokes me up, <laughs> but yes, how Laurel's plot was uh, portrayed in the first season. It was interesting because I knew all the facts from the get-go about who Vogue was, who Tyler was, um, and, you know, had been told very specifically by our showrunners and writers and everything that, you know, that this was the arc we were headed towards, um, but that, you know, there, there was going to be a, you know, a stretch of the season where a lot of folks were going to be very convinced that Laurel was extremely villainous. Laurel and Tyler never had like a sexual relationship right. whilst he was Tyler, but that Tyler and Vogue's okay. memories were so convoluted that when he started having flashbacks, uh, things were getting mixed up. Yeah. But obviously, that's still what is portrayed is, mm -hmm. you know, sexual assault right. in, in his mind. And that, again, is what Laurel has to come to grips with, which is why I, I truly believe she makes the choices that she does, you know, thanks to Saru and, you know, really being confronted with the reality of what she's done. Yeah. Um, and that she has truly, you know, messed with this person's mind. Um, so that to me is like what I always like to clarify, at least from what I was told and what I believe to be true for Laurel is that like she had an intimate relationship with Vogue and that's what she often alludes to. And again, they touch on that in, in Point of Light, this kind of moment to crystallize that Tyler's like, yeah, that was, <laughs> I still, I feel when you touch me, this is how I feel. Yeah. And well, that's a tragedy for Laurel because she doesn't want that. And she really does now care for Tyler, mm -hmm. you know, as a person. And obviously I think the hope there's a, at least in, in there's moments in point of light where she could still really hope that there might be a romantic relationship there. But I think what um, uh, Erica Lippold and, and Bowie Kim put in the, um, uh, what is my, <laughs> the name of my returning episode uh, the, with Pike, um, the 12th episode? Oh, yes. The episode was titled Through the Valley of Shadows. This is when your character, Laurel, considers the manipulation of time to be a weapon, unlike any scene before, which is why the Empire no longer exploits the time crystal where they were showing them in the Borath Monastery. Oh, also with your son who was taken to Borath to be raised as a son of none. Oh, that's right, yeah. Such an excellent episode where we really get, you know, with the crystals and, and my son and everything. It's a beautiful episode. Yes. Um, but we really do get this moment where Laurel acknowledges, you know, you were in, I was in love with Vogue who sacrificed everything um, and you are not him. And um, we get, you know, flavors of that throughout their relationship but i was really grateful that they gave us this quiet moment of laurel really getting to look tyler in the eye and say i get it and that they can be friends they can be allies um but i think there to me in the first season not knowing where we were headed exactly in the second um a big through line that that you know helped me yeah, thematically, thinking of it as a Shakespeare or Greek, Greek play is, is coming back to Laurel being from a different culture. And that also, I think it's an extremely feminist commentary because a sexual woman is viewed as predatory. Um, and we kind of invert the beauty and the beast archetype, which we have accepted so much in our society. We are constantly, whether it be an actual beast or just a toxic male, right. um, we are so accustomed and so fine to see the woman heal the toxic man. And so to have that reversed in a lot of different ways. And again, I, I, I don't, I think Laurel can be viewed as toxic from a human perspective, but mm -hmm. she is coming from a Klingon culture. Like she is coming from a completely different perspective and view on sexuality because 
it's often been portrayed in a more comedic way with us uh, Klingon sex <laughs> and uh, and particularly the women, obviously the draw sisters and, and the boob window and all of that. Yes. <laughs> um, but to me, I felt it was a great way to uh, to reexamine this these tropes that we've maybe become accustomed to and go mm -hmm. like, what is the reality of this female Klingon who is genuinely trying to bring Vogue out of this vessel that she doesn't see as um, as a human, as anything but her love. Wow, I love that character complexity, plus the feminist conversation this parallels and how you explained it, Mary. Even though he's human, Tyler is seeing the Klingon side as Vogue. You know, he sees it from a predatory human perspective, but he sees it still as an experience knowing what it's like to be Klingon. That makes this even more awesome for him to understand where Laurel's coming from, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, an examination of empathy yeah. on like a very, like, and why I love sci-fi is it's, it's metaphorical and literal. Like we get to see someone um, who, yeah, can see both sides or, yeah. you know, and I know Shazad spoke to this and I don't want to speak on his behalf, behalf but as a mixed race person mm -hmm. i know that that was like really significant to him as well oh, really? uh, to to you know to play a character who had you know straddled two different worlds and um i think for me more so when it came to gender um you know being a woman who embodies characteristics that are often associated with men mm -hmm. um you know, being empowered, literally my height, <laughs> like <laughs> having a lower register, things that I'm very like proud of and, and love about myself. Wow. I'm just blown away by your interpretation of the storylines and everything involved in this with Laurel and Tyler and Volk. Wow. It's wow. so fun to, to, especially because time, you know, a certain amount of time has passed and to really go back and, and remember all of those different aspects and be really like thrilled that I had that opportunity and yeah, that the story's out there, that that, you know, those episodes are out there and those conversations can keep happening. It's really neat. Yes, we love to see this too between your characters, Mary and Shazad Latifs as well. You know, we've never seen this portrayed so well on camera mm -hmm. and you both sold it because of your two backgrounds as actors. Like you said, thank you for sharing that. More with Mary Chifo in part two of this interview next week here on A Captain's Log. BK, a little teaser for our fans to look forward to in that is Mary is discussing her time at Juilliard, her parents' involvement, and our discussion with Mary about Shakespeare in the Klingon world. Plus, more Laurel talk, of course. And what was that line, Brian? Oh, you have never experienced Shakespeare until you have read him in the original <laughs> Klingon. That was from Star Trek VI, <laughs> The Undiscovered Country. More with Mary Chifo next week. Bye for now. Yourself into a human I can depend on to bring me 